Welcome to Just Asia, AHRC TV's weekly human rights program. These are the headlines. Changing perspective can help realize rights for a marginalized group in India. State brutality against citizens in Pakistan. Deadline approaching for Nepal's transitional justice institutions. Rule of law and penal code revision in Indonesia. Bangladesh electoral system and process. Welcome to AHRC TV's Just Asia, I'm April Wong. This week's episode of Just Asia is a special focus on the regional meeting of Asian parliamentarians and human rights defenders against torture held in Hong Kong in December. During the meeting focusing on modernizing criminal institutions, Just Asia interviewed several parliamentarians and rights defenders. Beginning with India, just Asia speaks to Dr. P. M. Nair, Chair Professor at the Tata Social Sciences Institute. According to Dr. Nair, institutions need to work together in India to combat torture, and he is confident that once this occurs, things will improve quickly. Dr. Nair also noted the importance of persons implementing laws and regulations to have a human rights perspective which would particularly help vulnerable and marginalized sections of society. The, the police, uh, the, the prosecution, the judiciary, a lot of issues are there. A lot of issues are there. And uh, the issue of torture itself is very, very strong there. It may not be noticed outside, but it is there. Now, in such a scenario, the India is not one, one state. It's so many states together. So each state police in India has to work on those lines. Naturally, it's the chief minister the, the, and the DG police, uh, the, the chief of prosecution and the chief justice and the high court, they all have to work together. But once they take a decision jointly and find out ways and means of uh, preventing torture, I think India can make a fast stride and a tremendous progress in a short time. That's my conclusion because things are actually good. Now, to make good, better and best, it will not take much of a time. And it's time that the human rights uh, defenders, which includes the right from the Honorable Chief Justice of India down the line everywhere, are all concerned. Now, we want to take our concern to a commitment and a commitment to an action. I think that will happen. This has to happen and I'm sure it will happen. The major issue which is in the entire Asian context and, and to India specifically, there are a lot of uh, uh, underprivileged sections of society the scheduled caste, the scheduled tribes, the backward caste, the minorities. And if you see them and other communities and see how each one gets the benefit of rule of law, there is that certainly a wide discrepancy. So when you have such strong human rights defenders in a nation like India, the point is why such underprivileged sections are still being deprived of their own rights. So obviously there is a gap. The gap lies not only not in the system, the rules and uh, rules and uh, constitution and provisions are all very good. The, it is the mind of the person concerned. The person who is implementing, that person also has to see from the human rights paradigm. When a, when a, uh, when a person from the minority com community or when a person from the backward section or when a person is handicapped, that person, is a, a, a person needs special care and attention. So unless we give that special care and attention, we will not be able to take justice forward. So in such cases, wherever we have an underprivileged group, which are nomenclature, including women and children, the, the, the just, justice defenders, means police, prosecutors, judiciary, activists, all of them have to take not only one step forward, but two steps forward. If you take that two steps forward, it's within the law. I'm not saying go beyond the law, but within the law, two steps forward, I think we can make a tremendous impact. That's what is required. And these steps lie in the mind of the person. Once the mind says, okay, I'm here, let me get the justice delivered, nothing stops. That's what is required. Next, Pakistan has been topping all the indices of human rights abuse in 2016. The establishment of military courts and moralism rights in execution has brought to the forefront state brutalities against citizens. Many of those hanged had been tortured into confessing. Just Asia interviews Pakistani member of National Assembly Imran Safal Aghari, 
to learn his views on the rising incidents of torture and corruption in the policing and judicial systems. Well, in my opinion, the justice of the, that is providing to the people of Pakistan, it's not the real justice we should work on it and to provide the people of Pakistan. It needs to be legislated. It's need to it's need to be checked. It needs to be. I mean, a system should be on a judiciary system as well. We need a check and balance, which is lacking in our country, and the parliament should have to play a role on it, and the parliament should have come forward to implement those laws, where the judiciary can be checked and balanced as well, because in the history we have seen a lot. We have seen the judicial murderers, we have seen the missing person cases. We have seen the misleading, the corruption cases. We have seen the we have seen the wrong somo to actions. So we have to work as a parliamentarian, as a parliament of Pakistan. We have to work strong on that and make some new laws to check on the judiciary so they can provide the pure justice to the people of Pakistan. 2013 was the first fair, uh, elections where the democracy was transferred to the democratic government. Before that, there was always an army intervention between the Pakistan. Democracy, to strengthen democracy, parliament has to play a very key role in it. As the history, if we go round and go back and we see the history of Pakistan, we have seen the too many military intervention in Pakistan that had weakened the parliament, that had weakened the par parliamentary system of Pakistan, that had weakened the political system of Pakistan. But now, it's, uh, it's been eight years, we are going in a, another general elections, inshallah, in 2018. And I think so, three more, ten or more of the democracy, then the parliament will be strengthened and the, democ and the real democracy you can see in Pakistan. Right now, it's like, uh, I don't want to criticize, I'm the opposition, I don't want to criticize the government. But right now, the the minister who's heading the department on interior minister federal i mean he's he's brutal himself i don't i don't i'm not uh, I'm, I'm not saying about him but it is a fact it is need to be sorted out from the federal then it will transfer to the to the provinces because the 18th amendment and whatever what happened in 2000 before the last 5 years in in pakistan people's party government we have strengthened the province, provinces we have given them powers to strength but the policy which makes which will go around the country should be the federation policy and i think so the police system should have we have we can hire the psychologists doctors and these kind of brutal interrogation is a not a solution interrogation is a not a solution interrogation for me if you do the interrogation with me i will say yeah i was thief if you, that was a famous you know, famous joke about a cow and elephant roaming around in a jungle and they say, oh, I'm a cow because the police is coming. You know, we need to sort it out. We need to provide them a justice. We need to provide them a legal system. We need to provide them a psychologist. We need to provide them at least every human is a not a criminal. No human born as a criminal. The society, its surroundings make him criminal. So every human has a capability to change anytime so we can work on it we have we can provide education to them we can provide a doctors to them interrogation is a, not a main solution for to admit the crime or i have done this i have done this it's a it's a just a brutal thing which i totally i'm against it and most of the parliamentarians all around the world are against it in nepal the February 2017 deadline for the Transitional Justice Commissions to complete their work is fast approaching. However, other than collecting over 60,000 complaints and starting preliminary investigations, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the Commission of Investigation on Enforced Disappeared Persons have not succeeded in anything meaningful. The conflict victims as well as the national and international community do not have any confidence in these commissions. Victims feel neglected from the transitional justice process and have little hope that justice will be served. Meanwhile, Nepal's anti-torture legislation is pending in the parliament with Kano Kumar Lama being released by the UK court. There are nominal chances for the parliament to pass the anti-torture legislation and put it into practice. 
Just Asia speaks to Mr. Dipendra Jha, a practicing lawyer at the Supreme Court of Nepal, for his views. Yeah, it was in the very fast track process basically, but after uh, Colin Kumar Lama, when he got a clean sheet in UK court and after he returned, I see the process has become slow. Uh, so what I feel that the process was fast and due to give a message to international community including UK uh, that we have our torture law that criminal actually that criminalized torture and we are going to pass so return him back to country because there was a kind of um, uh, uh, the UK court has said that okay you don't have a competent law in Nepal. Uh, because your law uh, does not treat torture as a criminal act, rather the civil act. So that's that's the reason that uh, after he returned, now the issue has become slow and nobody cares about it. I see now there is a uh, less uh, interest to pass it in a fast track process, but definitely we have like a whole bunch of traditional justice issue. Uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Disappearance Commissions. So both these these commissions actually uh, before they come to the conclusion of any recommendation about either prosecution or reconciliation, they need the Torture Act in Nepal. So I think uh, definitely they will pass, but the, it, it will take time with the transitional justice process. Now not with the uh, Kumar Lama case. Basically, I was in as an ex um, in expert committee of Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, drafting the law on investigation of human rights violation and uh, we have submitted uh, basically the how to investigate the uh, 60,000 cases which are pending in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So definitely there are large number of cases but we do not have like a uh, amended act because the Supreme Court asked to amend and uh, yeah. So that is one thing the I see there is a uh, some kind of delay from the government side in passing the uh, Truth and Reconciliation, amending the Truth and Reconciliation Commission Act. Another thing is that the term of the commissioner are going to expire in next three, four months and uh, I do not see there is any initiation to extend their amended, uh, their term. Third things I see like a lack of um, uh, human resources to investigate 60,000 uh, cases and lack of capacity within the commissions. And the reason for that is that international community is not cooperating with truth and reconciliation commissions because they are thinking that it is incompetent commission, the law is not uh, competent enough to that meets with the international criteria. So I see uh, now the time has come even for the international community to think whether they want to cooperate or not because if they do not cooperate the 60,000 cases are not going to be investigated. So I see these are some com uh, complex in, in transitional justice process. Next, Indonesia also faces a rise in executions and the use of the death penalty. At the same time, the revision of the country's penal code has been ongoing for over a decade. Member of the drafting committee, a parliamentarian Mr. Asu Sani, speaks about his views on the penal code revision process and rule of law in Indonesia. Uh, first of all, we basically provide the principle of rule of of law in our constitution. Yeah. Our constitution clearly states that Indonesia subject to the rule of law. Indonesia is what we call in the Dutch uh, term is Rechstaat, a state which based on rule of law, not Mahstaat, a state with based on a power. Yeah. That is uh, uh, the basic principle which we clearly provided in our constitution. Yeah. From the constitution, then yeah, we uh, further regulate in various act, various statute enacted by the parliament and the governments. For example, we uh, then regulate the uh, further principle of law and its operation uh, of the principle in the Judiciary Act, yeah? in the Police Act, in the uh, Prosecutor Act, yeah? and few other uh, act or statute. First, uh, I can explain that until today, 
our penal code is uh, inherited yeah from the dutch colonial era yeah which uh, uh, various law uh, added after indonesia got its independent yeah in the sitting term in the current sitting term of uh, uh, indonesian parliaments yeah we then with the governments agree to introduce the new penal code and now is being debated yeah another hot debate is on the capital punishment that penalty yeah but on this issue we yeah able to mediate between the group which is against uh, the capital punishment which demanding uh, the deletion the abolition abolishment of uh, uh, the capital uh, punishment which the group which persists with remain to insist that capital punishment should be maintained in the indonesian uh, criminal uh, law system yeah what is the middle way between the two group we agree principally to maintain the provision on the capital punishment as a kind of criminal punishment but if someone then uh, being judged with a final and binding court judgment yeah with uh, capital punishment then he or she put in prison and he or she becoming a good person not repeating any other crime during his life in prison and then within 10 years his or her uh, capital punishment will change automatically to be life imprisonment or 20 years in prison that is some uh, significant uh, obstacle and also progress which we have achieved uh, so far Bangladesh has been considerable violence and political manipulation in the last year. Dr. Badil Alam Ajumda, Secretary of Citizens for Good Governance, shares with Just Asia his views on free and fair elections and the Bangladesh electoral system. Bangladesh constitution uh, created an election commission to ensure that the elections are uh, credible as well as acceptable. And unfortunately, the, the system of election that has evolved, uh, especially in the last few years, uh, especially during this present election commission, under the present election commission, uh, the, uh, is not credible and is not acceptable. So if we look at the elections, uh, especially since uh, the beginning of 2014, the beginning with uh, our ninth parliament, our tenth parliament elections, and followed by Upazila election, which is sub district level uh, local government, uh, followed by uh, city corporation elections union provincial election which is the lowest level of local government and uh, and Poroshava uh, election municipal elections and all of these elections were not credible the election commission has not been fair the election commission has not been neutral and people complained they didn't pay attention to those and in fact recently uh, the uh, they had to uh, the court uh, at one point intervened in some cases uh, when people complained 
and election commission didn't pay any attention they went to the court and court asked the election commission to uh, look into the matter and the election commission didn't do that and finally court the high court uh, asked the election commission all the election commissioner to go to the high court and apologize and uh, uh, to the to the court and this was quite a humiliating experience and in fact after that uh, it say it speaks a volume about the about the neutrality and competence and the ability of these this commission in fact after after such humiliating experience uh, they have no right to stay in, in the positions they have been holding there is a connection there is a strong connection unfortunately since the government came with one side came to power with one side election without a mandate without the consent of the people and uh, so it, to stay in power uh, they need to use force basically they need to use uh, they need to uh, use uh, means which are which are not consistent the human rights uh, covenants and human rights uh, the uh, what we expect in a in a in an in a society in an environment uh, they are not consistent with uh, the uh, people's protecting human rights so since the government has no mandate they had to use force and that necessarily led to human rights violations excesses and uh, and manipulating the system and various ways of various ways of intimidating people and uh, in other ways uh, making sure that people don't speak up people don't protest people uh, people's rights are uh, taken away the uh, some of the fundamental rights are taken away and unfortunately all our institutions have been eroded uh, the our constitutional institution our uh, statutory institutions and even uh, non state institutions uh, such as uh, civil society is in is under serious pressure serious threat mm. justice institutions if we talk about the uh, the uh, judiciary higher judiciary lower judiciary lord judiciary there is widespread accusations of corruption and manipulations and influencing uh, judgments you can buy judgments there are there are uh, there are allegations hey judiciary there are accusations and and uh, most serious thing that happened to the high judiciary is the partisan appointments that is all for the episode of just asia for more on this and other issues please visit www.humanrights.asia or www.alc.asia/justasia thank you for watching and see you next week <laughs>